Eugene Smith, I'm really grateful that you've uh, taken the time to talk with us. Thank you for your memoir, um, which I've read and, and very much appreciated, and I'm grateful for the, the time. That Thank you as well. Now. I want to start with, um, with something that I'm sure you've heard many times. So we're in November 1978. I was a kid in Southern California, came home, heard news reports, of like maybe two or 300 people had died in a country I'd never heard of before. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure I you know, even knew that it was in another country, I just heard about this event. And then over the next few days, the numbers kept growing and growing and growing and eventually we get up to 900. Now I'm, a, I'm a, or over 900, I'm, I'm a little kid, so I'm not paying a lot of attention to what's going on, but I do have vague memories of, you know how it is after these kinds of events, they bring the, sort of the people on TV, the experts to, to, to talk to mm -hmm. us all this. I remember hearing about people needing to be deprogrammed. I remember hearing about sort of the, you know, the mindless obedience to the leader. And all of these were assumptions that I had until I actually began to talk to people who had either been to Jonestown or knew about People's Temple. And I think almost inevitably, when you have these huge assumptions about things and you think you know a story, and then you start talking to individuals who actually know that story from the inside, you inevitably find, I think, that it's more complicated and more interesting. And what I haven't found, uh, and what I don't anticipate finding with you, is anything like an unthinking robot. What I'm finding are human beings who found themselves in a particular context, in a particular situation. So my first question after that lengthy, you know, sort of lead in, my first question is, it's easy for me to talk about because I'm just a kid in Southern California just listening to news reports and not really caring a whole lot, you know, because right. I'm a typical kid. You're on the other side, you're a young adult when all this is going down and you're, in addition to what you've experienced in Jonestown, you're picking all this up from, from the society that you lived in until pretty recently. So my first question is, you know, what impact did that have? Has that had? Does that continue to have? Speaking for yourself to the extent you can, speaking for other folks who were at Jonestown, were in Georgetown at the time, the Capitol guy in, who had connections with the People's Temple, what impact did that have, that this sort of talk about, you know, sort of the unthinking following of the leader and things like that? Well, I, I guess the main thing is, is that they were, they were talking about something that they, were, they weren't very aware of, and they had spoken to none of the people yet. What they were going, what they were going by, was the incident. What happened afterwards? They they never took into account that a lot of those people were forced, um, murdered, etc. It wasn't like they all laid down and said, "Okay, well, just pour it on me" or whatnot. Um, yeah. And it's it's kind of it's sort of like Americans tend to react to things that they see abroad rather than study it and then respond accordingly. Um, being in America or being American gives you a certain privilege to look at things in a skewed fashion and be okay with it and be able to justify it and defend it and everything, although it's completely wrong. It's completely incorrect. Mm. It's different when you're living in the U.S. and you look at international news versus being somewhere else and looking back at the news about the U.S. Mm -hmm. Nice to see America from abroad or from different points of view versus the only view you get here stateside, border to border. Yeah. I was, it wasn't so much, I was already traumatized, but to know that these people I don't know hate me and they're accusing me of something that I wasn't even there uh, and would not allow it to happen had I been there. Um, it it was infuriating to 
have to justify something that I didn't do. In other words, well, I wasn't there. I didn't do this. Well, but you could have done this. How could I? I was 250 miles away. Well, that's only like that's only like three hours away. No, that's 24 hours away. Yeah. 250 miles from Georgetown to Jonestown takes 24 hours. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you're just gonna get there. Part of the story is you were in you were in Georgetown. If I have it right from memoir, you were working with customs, right? You were working on correct, you know, things coming in, helping bringing in equipment, etc. Right, Dustin Poor Jonestown. So you were you were in Georgetown when what happened in Jonestown went down. And if I remember right, you're watching the movie Tora Tora Tora. Yeah. Is that right? When someone yes, correct. tells you that something's gone right. And then if I further have it right, um, you you don't really even know what happened in Jonestown until about 24 hours later. Is that, is that what happens is we're at the uh, movie theater and the huh, <laughs> theater personnel came down and said, Hey, there's been a shooting at Lamaha Gardens. So we all get out, get up and rush out. Um, we get home, there's been no shooting. However, there are there are multiple murders inside the house of Sharon Amos and her family. Right. Um, initially going over, I'm thinking that it was probably an errant shot from the GDF base, Guyanese Defense Force, because they were less than probably a thousand yards from us, you know, in La Maha Gardens. That's they, what, they set up. Had they set up around that area? No, no. Their their, their base was basically across the street. <laughs> I mean, I, I say across the street, but it's like maybe a quarter mile away. Wow. wow. It was very casual in the sense that, oh yeah, that's the GDF base right there, and we never had any interaction with them because there was no need for it. Um, the the encampment didn't happen till later on that night as uh, questioning and interrogations were going on. And that's when they surrounded the house. And, and it was to protect the citizens from us, not, not protecting us. Although you're not there when what happens in that place, you do, I think you do see the aftermath. And we're talking yes. about Sharon Amos, who took her own life and then is the life of three of her children as well? Yes. Yes. Um, and then, as you say in the memoir, you know, you are fingered as having been involved in, in if not that, in the, you know, it's a complicated story, but there were um, the, um, well, well, actually, let me, let me put it in the form of a question. You were accused okay. of, you were accused of being involved somehow. Is that, do I have that right? No. Um, what I have been accused of was being part of a hit squad. Right, related to the plane, is that right? Right, related to the plane and that the basketball team was actually a hit squad and that I had been instructed by Stephen, Stephen Jones to bring the plane down. Yeah. And, and it was, it's, it's really ironic because Stephen was in town on the basketball team. I was already there when they arrived. Yeah. Uh, was in, the person that f fingered me, so to speak, yeah. was in Georgetown. In fact, he's one, I mean, in Jonestown, in fact, he's one of the last survivors that escaped. Yeah. So him hearing a conversation is that doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's, there's no timeline for that. Sure. Um, in addition, it was just, it's farcical. So I'm going to ask you a question that I know that you can't answer because okay. it's, it's inexplicable to someone who's not in your shoes, but okay. to the extent possible, so you're you're working customs for People's Temple in Guyana. Correct. You're watching a World War II movie. You're told that there's been a shooting. You get to La Maha, did I get that pronunciation right? There's La Maha. Which, La yeah, Maha Gardens, yeah. right. Okay, you get that. You see what's happened there, which is horrific. Mm -hmm. And then very shortly you find yourself being accused of something that you weren't part of at all. Any one of these events would be traumatic, right? I mean, that's another right. statement. Any one of these events would be mm -hmm. a significant trauma in a person's life for the rest of that person's life that that person would remember. And by my count, we've got three. 
things that have come together within a Correct. very short space of time. So here's the question impossible to answer. I mean, how can you, what, what words would you describe, what words would you use to describe just sort of your own mental, spiritual, psychological state in that first 24 hours as you're trying to absorb and, you know, just take in what's, what's going on? Survival, because now it's me. We're no longer a group. We're individuals inside of a house that was part of a group that has been demolished, <laughs> that is gone. And so the thing about the brotherhood for me at that point was there is no brotherhood that was destroyed. That was destroyed 250 miles away in the middle of the jungle. And I can't trust any of you either because I wasn't here at the house when these other murders happened. I also wasn't at the house when the radio command came over to ham radio to do this and this and this. So I'm in, I'm back in the exact same moment I was within my first hour of coming into Jonestown. And that is, here I am again in a foreign country. I'm not in the jungle, I'm in a city. But all I have is a pocket knife. Mm. These GDF soldiers, they have their rifles, they have their pistols, uh, the uh, Georgetown police are there, they have their sidearms. They're scared. Um, they're also, in terms of being scared, they're trying to control that by being overly controlling. And that turns, in, that turns a interview into an interrogation very, very quick. And the reason being, they know for a fact there's been murders in Jonestown. They don't know how many because it has, it, it's, 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 it's pitch black out there. For one yeah. Thing. yeah. Yeah. And it's the day of. So things are still being uncovered. They can't uncover it until the next morning, which would be the morning of the 19th. And that's when you people here in the United States have already gotten reports that there's like two or 300 bodies have been discovered. Right. And um, we're not hearing anything or very little at the house. And so we don't, I didn't know everyone in Jonestown was dead until the 21st. Wow. And so each day it's okay. Well, we found this many bodies, but we didn't find this. Okay. Well, okay. Those were senior citizens. Okay. Ollie got away. She's with a child, you know, and uh, and then so well we found some young people, but we didn't find any babies. I said, okay, so she's still getting away, and then on the twenty first, we found everything, and that's that was death for me in terms of my life at that point ended, in terms of People's Temple, in terms of Jones, in terms of Jonestown, in terms of Georgetown, in terms of friendships. When that was a fact, that all ended for me that day. And it was about having to rebuild after that. So I took that as, that is my death, I'm gone. Because everything that, everything that described me, that, that I had an impression on or had an impression on me is gone. My whole, is gone. The whole of it is gone. Uh, pictures, memories, mementos, friendships, uh, spats you had with other people men or women or guys and gals that you didn't like other people that you really loved you really cared about you, you know you never told them how much you cared about them uh, people who you could not stand mm. but it was like I didn't want you to die mm. <laughs> you know I mean it, it's mm. like in your neighborhood you, know, you have some neighbors you really like you have neighbors that some neighbors you don't really care about you know, like whatever but you don't wish the worst for them you just you just don't want to end you just don't interact with those folks, that's all. I remember describing it to someone, I said, you go to sleep one night on the couch in the front room. Your wife is in a bedroom, your child is in the other bedroom. You wake up the next morning, your child is dead, your wife is dead. You go outside, everybody on your block is dead. There's no buses, there's no traffic. You go down to the store, everybody in the store is dead. 
Everybody's dead at the gas station. My whole life stopped that day. There's no recovery from that. There's no justification for that. There's no way to explain it. Mm -hmm. And people kept asking, explain it, explain it, explain it. I can't. And that created even more anger. You're holding back. You're not telling us what we want to know. But I can't tell you what I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a that's a powerful passage, man. And at the end of your memoir, you you know you give some uh, you um, include some pages from your FBI file. Correct. And I, and I read that, and you know, and it's the same kind of it's the same kind of response. Like you know, this guy, this Eugene Smith guy is in this situation. He's a bundle of information. You know, we put different labels on this on this guy. Right. When was the first time that you can remember that somebody in the context of this, and this is really what I want to do, because you know, we don't we don't need to go through all these details of people's temple in Jonestown. That's been, you know, I don't I, I want to hear from you as a human being, you know. When was the when was the first time that you can remember? somebody approaching you in relation to this theme as a human, reaching out to you as a human and wanting to hear from you as a human who had experienced this, this thing. That was years after the fact. Yeah. Uh, the... I don't think I probably got asked until 80, I got back December of, um, well, December 29th, 78, and what you're asking me to answer probably didn't, I didn't get that until 80, 81, maybe where somebody just asked like, how are you? What's going on? What happened? You know, we can talk. How are you? Yeah. And and the, th the thing is, I was reluctant, um, only because I know I was being monitored. I know I was being watched. I know I was being followed. It doesn't make for a comfortable environment to, in terms of having conversations with people, even people that you know, but you haven't seen them in years. So you don't really know them. You've known them at one time in your life, but you don't know them now. And going through that situation and dealing with alphabet agencies, mm -hmm. it puts you on a whole other course in terms of how you interact with people or what you say to people, how you say it to people, or how you're perceived. Uh, it also puts you into not a position of defense, but in a position of you must be aware of your surroundings at all times. No matter where you're at, you have to be aware of your surroundings. And, and because of what had happened, I didn't have the privilege or the... I didn't have the privilege to take anything casual. And the impossible can happen. That wasn't supposed to happen. That was supposed to be impossible. That could never happen. Well, it happened. And so that changed my whole concept of how I view the world and how I view individuals. And going back to, you have to be aware of your surroundings, always. You describe yourself in the memoir. There's a, there's a part of the memoir that reminds me of what you read from uh, combat veterans, especially from the more recent conflicts. Although, honestly, I mean, you know, I think what what you experience is, is much more difficult from what, you know, some of those veterans will face. But they, you know, you write about, um, I forget exactly, but getting from one place in California to another place in California at a ridiculously fast speed and in a short amount of time on a motorcycle and kind of that. Right. And, I, and I think, if I remember right, um, that you do actually raise the, you know, the um, mentioned PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, are, are those the kind of, and well, let me, you know, I talked to a lot of combat veterans and it's kind of like this hypervigilance 
very difficult to trust. You're in the restaurant and you want your back facing, you want your back to as few people as possible. You want to be able to have your eyes on as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, does that does that all resonate with you? Yeah, that did resonate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, but but see the th what 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 the what civilians don't understand is, <clears throat> in terms of my situation or or for a combat veteran is, is that, at that moment in time, that's your world. And the world isn't the world you left. It's the world you're at. You're trying to get back to the world you left, but but that's not going to happen anytime soon. And so, in order to get back to the world, no pun intended you have to be aware of what's going on around you. Because if you don't, you could be that accident, you could be that incident, you can be, it, it was just happenstance. We don't know what happened, it just happened. Um, and it stays with you in terms of there's no such thing as impossible. It can all happen. It can all happen all at once. Therefore, be careful. Therefore, yeah. be vigilant. Therefore, pay attention. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be hyper vigilant, right, but right. You, you you walk into a unknown place, you scan, sure, and the room, and you just make a general observation. Yeah, for whatever it might be, you look for things that are out of place. Yeah, <laughs> why does everybody have on short pants and no shirt, and this guy has on a suit <laughs> <laughs> with a microphone in his ear, and he's not. Oh. And taking orders, <laughs> you know, so yeah. I, I mean, that's that's a simplistic way of seeing it, but that that's basically it. I hear what you're saying. As what I found is as time goes by, I find myself less and less interested in Jim Jones and more and more interested in the in the folks who are there. Um, does that make any sense to you? I mean, obviously, you don't have Jim Jones without, I mean, you don't have Jonestown without Jim Jones. Yeah, you do. I, I, well, explain how. Yeah, how does well, that? Well, the thing is, <laughs> when, from other survivors, when Jones wasn't in Jonestown, it was fun. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> and it operated without him being there for a long time. Wow, yeah. Um, disruptive in the in the sense that it it didn't it didn't become disruptive and mistrusting until he arrived. Now he was there when I got there, so I walked into an environment like that. But when I talked to survivors that were there, had been there for years, it was completely di different type of atmosphere. And just a few months that I was there, it got it went from stressful to being extremely stressful, to being on alert. And that's because you're having multiple white nights. Um, you're not getting much rest or very little sleep. You're, you're going to, you're going to, you, you're dealing with every day, but you have all these concerns about all these what ifs in the back of your head as you're doing your job, whatever that might be. And what, what worked for me was the further I got away from the compound, the better it was for me because I heard less of him. And even when he left the States to come over to Jonestown permanently, everything calmed down here. So he had a certain electricity about him that he created that kept things in turmoil, so to speak. Yeah. And, hmm. and, and truth be told, it got to, once we knew what the mission was, and the mission was like to make the world a better place, and in order to do that, you can't force people, you have to show them an example. If you give them the right example and stick to it, they'll come say, hey, I, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing this. I like that. Can I, can I give it a chance? Come on, give it a try. Um, and that's, that's what attracted a lot of folks, right, in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, because good stuff was happening. It was. And, and the thing is, it just, I don't know what happened to him. And I never will. 
and I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make the effort to really try to find out. Yeah. Um, it's past tense at this point, and mm -hmm. those of us survivors that are left, we're still present, and so we have to deal with the present. And the present is is that we have been an asset to society and not a deficit. Um, mm -hmm. We still work in community organizations, community groups, individually, of course. Um, we've we've done nothing to deserve the type of commentary that comes up either every year or every few years in terms of what they were in comparison to what they are and what they've done. Um, it was... When he wasn't around, things went very smoothly because you knew what to do. He wasn't necessary anymore. Wow. He was back. For me, he was background noise. For others, he was static. But everyone knew what they needed to do. He wasn't necessary anymore. And that might have been a fallacy. Yeah. I wonder, there's probably there's no way to answer this. I, I wonder if he kind of picked up on that in a way and felt like he was losing, like he was losing control, that these, these folks, you know, at some point, I mean, you, as you say, you knew what to do. You guys had built, I mean, everybody who, everybody I've heard, I've heard from or I've read or I've listened to who went to Jonestown and said, look at what these folks have accomplished in the middle of the jungle of like I think one of the most densest, one of the most dense jungles in the world. What these folks have accomplished is really amazing. Yeah. I'll give you a quick story on that. Yeah. The EF, Guyanese Defense Force, came in after the fact yeah. and they to set up base there. We couldn't handle it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's it. They couldn't oh. handle it. Wow. Well then, let's let's put Jones aside. Tell me about the community. Tell me about the the, the people who are there. I, you you have a great great phrase. A great uh, you you say that Chuck Bikeman got a name, right? Here's a guy who who was illiterate, right? Who had no great prospects in life. Maybe even wasn't deeply committed to the cause. I don't know. Please correct me. But he, but he had a sense of purpose. He had a sense of mission. He, he did important work down there, if I have it right. That's just one example. Chuck, Chuck was very good people. Just a really, he was innocent. And what I mean by innocent is, is that I'm not going to judge you based on your color. I'm not going to judge you based on your size, your demeanor. I'm gonna judge you on you. I'm not gonna judge you on how I think I how I think you should be. <laughs> I'm gonna take you at, at your worth and we'll work with that. That's Chuck. Mm. Um, mm. At the same time, he was a man that was, if you done something for him or with him, he was forever grateful. Mm. So he got a name. I mean, you use that phrase, you know, here's yeah. a guy who had a place in the world and he's doing important work. You, you, you refer to pride in work. You, um, you say, referring to yourself, the sense that I'm doing a good thing. I've heard you say, and then, and then read it again in your memoir, that, you know, in the temple, you all did something well that we in American society don't do pretty well, and that is respect those folks who are older, right? Respect the elderly, right? Correct, because the elderly are your, uh, is your repository of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. That's firsthand knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't been written yet. <laughs> it's being passed on. Um, well, that, that deserves respect then and now. Just the basic wisdom of listening to people who've been alive longer than I have. Than I have. Correct. <laughs> Let's put Jones aside. I mean, I just want to hear you talk for a, a little while. Put him aside. Tell me about the people. Tell me about the community. You know? 
in terms of, of, of Jonestown or just people simply here in terms of Redwood Valley, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Fresno? Whatever, whatever, whatever pops in your mind. It was, um, it was fun being a teenager because you had a, whatever your interest was, that professional was in the temple somewhere. You just had to find him, her, or they. And once you found him, her, or they, and you ask him a question, will you show me? They were happy to show you. Mm. There was almost as if they were indebted to show you. Mm. I'd, I'd like that, I liked photography. Okay, so, I, so Don Jackson got me into photography. Um, I like I like printing. So Tim, um, I <laughs> I'll say this last Clancy. He was in charge of the printing. He was in charge of the printing press. So I was like, yeah, hey, this is how you do this. This is offset printing, etc., etc., etc. If you want to learn plumbing, you go to Harry Williams. If you want to learn construction, you go to um, I forget his last name. His first name was Ken. He was in the wood shop. There were all these people you could access day and night, every day of the week, every night of the week. Um, so for a, for an outgoing person, it was Candyland. For an extrovert, it was like, ah, I have arrived. For an introvert, it was still okay because you didn't have to interact with those people. Mm -hmm. You used to go around them. It was no problem. You were allowed to be what you were allowed to be. And I, 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 I say something that people misinterpret. And Gil Scott Heron wrote this song called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Mm -hmm. You know, it will not be on TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. People take that at face value. But the first revolution of you and anybody else is when you change your mind. The way you see things, the way you look at people, the way you interact, the way you take in the world around you. When it changes your mind, that's revolutionary. And so when you talk about revolution, you talk about some people who just, they just changed their mind, the way they thought, the thought process. Other people went out and pounded the concrete to get to get names for, for a proposition that was beneficial to people in the Fillmore. Uh, there are other people who went to food banks, didn't go to food banks, they went to different types of grocery stores uh, or businesses. Hey, we'll take your excess food to bring that back for people who didn't have food. Um, so revolution isn't always at the, at the end of a gun. Mm -hmm. And that's how I saw People's Temple. It was very wide ranging in terms of its influence in, the, in, in San Francisco slash California, as well as just an individual. You could, be, you could be in the group or you could be an individual within the group. But when the public saw you, it was the group. They didn't see you as, as the individual. Well, this is what I saw. I'm not worried about the rest of that. This is what interests me. And you never get everything you want. And so you have to accept you, you have to accept sometimes that you don't get the hundred percent. You get seventy-five, you get eighty. And it's not that you have to be satisfied, but you have to be able to live with that and move on. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. It's such a as an outsider looking in. It's such a mystery. I mean, let me just, I'll just say this, and then if you have a response. As an outsider looking in, it's such a mystery because um, because there's so much that's so attractive. You know, this is why the movement grows. And, you know, I've heard this before, that the, um, the Guyana Defense Forces wanted to take over Jonestown, but it didn't work out. I mean, you know, Apparently they're not up to something that that y'all did, you know. Right, and and it's in their backyard. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and and you got classes for the kids. You you know, um, 
old folks are being taken care of, you know? And so, you know, this, this is the part of the story that I still don't think is broken through. But there's something really, you know, really impressive here, you know, there's something really impressive. But of course, you know, the incident, as you say, that that just kind of renders you speechless. I mean, almost, almost right there, it's like you're talking about this beautiful thing and then there's the incident and it's like everything comes to a screeching halt. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is that, that, that can't be explained. At least I can't explain it. Yeah. And I'm not sure if there's anybody around at this time that can really explain it. There's, in, the next, in the upcoming months and years, you're going to be, there'll be more books written. Um, hopefully I'll open the door for that. I hope so. There's, 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 there's so many stories out there, stories and events that the, 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 co the common person has no idea what we were doing, you know, in terms of good things for everyone. Um, but to encompass that in a single book is impossible. And even though I wrote this, this one, originally it was going to be volume one of two. Mm. Um, because this book, Back to the World, it, it walks you through, but it's actually highlights. Mm. Mm. Um, and, 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 and that's a good thing. Because I wanted to read her to see it and read it, but also learn enough to want to research stuff on their own. Yeah. Validate what I'm saying or, 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 or debate me on it, either or. Mm -hmm. And typically, I, I, I should have gave, I wish I would have gave instructions on how to read the book. And that, that sounds strange. Mm -hmm. because you read it from front cover to back cover, you get the gist of it. You understand it. If you start and read the appendix and or just the FBI files first, what it does when you read it, you mm -hmm. look at me through their eyes. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to do that while reading the book and get to the end, you've learned a lot about how we how the thought process of Americans work. You also learn about the process of, um, of agencies, how a rumor can become fact, how, it, how just a little innuendo all of a sudden becomes a, a treatise on this person's terrible, um, and how that something, something that simply said can be misinterpreted so many different ways, and how that a single incident a single incident which you were not a witness to defines you and your life for the remainder of your life. Mm. And it, it almost, it can stymie a regular person. You got to be above, you got to be above the regular grade, be able to get through all of that and be normal at the end and mm. be able to enjoy life and, and find humor and find beauty and, it takes a lot to come from that to get to that, wow. to get to the point to where you can be appreciative again. Well, that, that gets me to the, the one part of your book that I disagreed with, and that is when you say, I want the incident to be remembered, but I want to be forgotten. And I'm like, no, 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 please. Don't, don't know that <laughs> I want be, what I wanted to do was I wanted to give folks a different view, another channel. Yeah. And hopefully I hopefully I will succeed at that. Yeah. Um, I don't need them to remember me personally. What I want them to remember are the, are the passages and the readings in this book and, and the files and the appendix to see how how someone who doesn't who's done nothing can get blamed for something and all of a sudden it's the truth. And there's no defense against it. I couldn't defend it. Well, you know, I, I, I was only thinking of this a minute ago when you were talking about the FBI files present Eugene Smith as a thing. 
Yeah. The, the memoir presents Eugene Smith as a human being. Correct. And that reminds me of something I tell my students in my history class, you know, um, it's easy to beat up on people who can't defend themselves. And, you know, dead people obviously can't defend themselves. So, you know, it's easy to beat up on people in the past. But let's Correct. not treat people in the past like things. Let's treat them like human beings, you know. And that, that passage you read, you know, kind of this, this world, very few people in this, you know, that passage that very few people in this world can really comprehend because they've never experienced anything like it. But you wake up one day and everyone is gone and everything right. is, is, is fundamentally changed. Let me, let me put you in front of my students or put you in front of, you know, some group of young people. And I'm thinking about these human beings, you know, these human beings who found themselves in a particular context, particular environment. Um, what are the what are the human lessons? You know, what are the human lessons after after uh, November 18, 1978? We're hearing a lot of people talking about cults and mind control and all this stuff. Okay, whatever, you know. Okay, but what are the human lessons? Because I don't think that the people, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the people in Guyana, the people in Georgetown with you, I don't think they were fundamentally different creatures from the rest of us. They were in a particular context, a particular environment. What can, what can we learn from that? I mean, what, what are the, what, what's the human story? What are the human lessons? Simply put, the human lesson is, is that you cannot judge people based on your experience. Mm -hmm. You have to see people as they are and allow yourself to see them as they are and not make up an image you want them to be. Mm -hmm. I can change you. No, you can't change me. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't happen like that. The, mm. the, the the lesson is you have to. You cannot allow yourself in in no type of relationship to change your partner to be the person you want them to be for you. Mm. They're attracted to that person as they are and you accentuate each other, or you're attracted to that person and you think that you can mold them into the person you want them to be. And what I see in today's society, and this is my own personal opinion, yeah. that, well, jo Jamie did it, I'm going to do it. Well, if Jamie and Joe did it, Gene's going to do it. And then, well, well, Jamie, Joe, and Gene, they're all through. So we're going to, and they end up following each other, and they all look the same. They all dress the same. They all have the same stock. It's, it's, it's like carbon copies. And I tell young people, be an individual. Listen to what your friends say, but it doesn't mean you have to become them. Mm. You have to have your own belief system, your own strength, your own, like, as something hits the fan, this is where I stand up. This is this is my line in the sand. I will not go past this. I will, nobody, I will allow nobody else to cross over this with me. And it's hard for people now to be individuals because of you're so inundated by everything outside of yourself. Your phone, the social media on your phone, your, your laptop like we're on right now. Um, mm. I was growing up, television only stayed on to midnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, see, you see, like, it'd be the Pledge of Allegiance and that would be it. TV would go off. Yeah. Well, TV's 24-7 plus now. Yeah. yeah. Radio is 24-7 plus. Mm -hmm. There's no downtime for people to become introspective, to learn about who they are, or just read. Um, people like audio books. Well, okay. Why won't you read it? Mm. I 
I wanted red to be. Well, well, they might not read it with the same with the same accents that you would, or parts that you find exciting. They might find boring and, and read it to you like it's boring, but it's not meant to be boring at that particular stage. And mm. and and the world is telling us that we we all have to be the same to make this work, and it's, that's that's absolutely wrong. Because if if we become homogenized one thought, one process, we can't react to anything. I mean, all we can do as, is react. We can't respond to anything because we all have the same mindset. It's the mindset. It's like, um, it's like the Star Trek thing, the Borg. Hmm. And what the Borg say, we will assimilate. You know, and so all the Borgs are interconnected and they don't think as individuals. They think out of one mindset. Hmm. Um, that's not good. That's not good. So my main, my main, my main thing is, yeah. you have to be an individual in society. You can be part of society, but become yourself first. Find who, find out who you are. Become your person. Then venture out and say, okay, I'm going to try this because I have a foundation to work from. And whatever things they want to call it, cults or mind programming, the basic is, is that you have individuals that have not became individuals. They're, being, they're, they're becoming a part of the whole. And what they're bringing is my subservience and versus, hey, I got a new idea. I got a new way to do this. Uh, we can try this, we can try that, but that ain't working. Um, it's, it's hard to be an individual now. Individuals are ostracized unless you're a bully. <laughs> and 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 we see that in in in, in politics. Mm -hmm. So I hear you. So we're members of a community, right? And you know, mm -hmm. we decided to work. We've got to be members of a community. But members made up of individuals. As you were speaking, I was thinking of, um, you know, how you describe that part of people's temple where people brought different gifts to the table, the plumber. Exactly. Now when, now when it comes to, you know, sort of ideas and, you know, listening to the leader, maybe it's a different thing, but we just isolate that. How these people brought their different gifts, their different strengths, their different abilities to the table. Their abilities, their professions, yeah. their nuances. There are people who couldn't, who wouldn't know how to work a shovel. Yeah. They knew how to teach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there were those that knew how to teach, work a shovel, but they didn't interact very well. Mm -hmm. They didn't like to be around, they couldn't deal with a lot of people or a big group at one time. Fine. Let's take their strength and allow them to do that. You know, I mean, I'm being yeah. now. You dig that hole over there and we'll play an audio book for you. <laughs> yeah. if that's what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you have to appreciate individualism. You have to you have to learn to appreciate the individual strengths of people. And mm -hmm. it's, we're, we're moving away from that as a society. And as we move away from individualism, what builds up is mistrust because you're not like me. I don't trust you. You're different from me. I'm supposed to be different from you. Because I'm a different person. Because I'm a different person, exactly. Yeah. But we can agree on something that we're both, you know, like, yeah. hey, play basketball. Yeah, I play basketball. Yeah. Sure. Does, does, does this work for you? So, you know, kind of that, that mental image of, you know, we're in a community. Folks bring different gifts. Plumber, printer, teacher, lawyer, psychologist, whatever. All those gifts are pulling together. And then when it comes to the individual able to stand up and push back when necessary. I'm thinking of Christine Miller, right? Mm -hmm. What if what if one or two or three or four others had stood up with Christine on that day and said, I, I agree with Christine. Is that kind of what you're calling for? We need more. Yeah, and, 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 more and, and that did happen. That did happen. And if, what I base that on is when they found when they went in and looked at the bodies, there were injection marks in the neck the back of the neck and the shoulder blades. 
And so were they being ran after or had they already fell? But that in it that in itself tells you there was resistance. So that's what I'm saying. Not everybody does the same thing. Yeah. You know, I can't stand up and talk, but I can run. That's my disagreement. I'm going to run. You know, uh, or I'm not going to agree with this. And I, 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 I can't even imagine or phantom the pandemonium it must have been. Those last moments. Yeah, and I think this is a really important thing that um, I think I don't think most people know that. You know, you can watch the documentary and you learn about Christine Miller, but that, as you say, there's evidence that there was there was a degree of, of resistance that that yeah. day. We're not talking about mind numbed, you know, mind numbed. Mm -hmm. You know, Eugene, it's such a it's such a um, a privilege to talk to talk with you and to hear from you. I'm really glad you 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 wrote the memoir. Thank you. Um, before we wrap this up is there anything else on your mind that you'd like to that you'd like to to share i mean you know folks are interested in what you in what you have to say be the person you are and not the person they want you to be you know i mean i'm not saying that if you're like eight or nine years old but if you're an adult be the person that you are and not what and not think what they want you to be and you'll find that you'll find the inner strength you'll find success it might, it might not be the same success in terms of your cohort, but a success in the sense that you found peace in doing it and you're satisfied with that. Uh, not everybody's accomplishment is your accomplishment. Not everybody's wealth is your wealth. Uh, there's different degrees of that. And we've already discussed that in terms of revolution. It could be with a pen. It could be with a change of, a, change of thought. It doesn't have to be a rifle. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Welcome.